Okay, now, the politics of water has such a complicated and complicated history in California, as we have seen. Uh, and it's no surprise that this film had to marshal so much talent, so many resources, to be able to reveal this hugely complex and largely secret history. Uh, so my first question is, what is the origin story of Water and Power, a California heist? Uh, how did it come about and what was your role in it? Uh, well, thank you. Um, by the way, the film looked fantastic. This is a, a wonderful facility. Um, and it sounded great, too. Um, so um, thanks for inviting me here. I'm pleased to be here. The, um, the origin story of the film, I'll make it as short as I can. Um, it actually started with me. Um, I was um, a couple of years ago working in Alex Gibney's company, um, Jigsaw Productions, um, running television series development for Alex. And, and I know you're all familiar with a lot of his films, Going Clear, Scientology film, um, Steve Jobs, Lance Armstrong, um, Enron was his first film he directed. Um, he's a major, major investigative um, documentary filmmaker. And um, I had a kind of environmental, um, you know, sort of layman's plus knowledge of environmental issues from having run original programming at Sundance Channel where we programmed a lot of, and I, and I oversaw the production of a lot of um, series about environmental issues. So I was fairly knowledgeable about, uh, certainly that water was gonna be a big issue for the 21st um, century, the oil of the 21st century. And, um, you know, cut to uh, two years ago when I'm at Jigsaw and um, picked up the New York Times, and, and it was living in New York at the time too, read an article about how some aquifers were collapsing in, in California. There was subsidence, you know, the, the, the ground collapsing. And um, all these water wars that I thought were decades away, but I knew were coming, and I, I'm worried about my daughter. I have a 15-year-old daughter. Like, what's she gonna drink in the year 2040 or 50? Um, and that just uh, raised an alarm in me. I thought, oh my God, it's happening now. Mm -hmm. Like, the water wars here, now. So uh, I'm passionate about the issue, and um, I pitched it to Alex, and then we, <sighs> Um, pitched it to National Geographic. They were looking for a water project. They had been pitched many, didn't find any of them interesting. It all felt like lectures and boring and um, you had to know and nothing entertaining. And the way that, um, that I conceived it was as a kind of investigative thriller, kind of a Chinatown. And that's what Alex Gibney does very well. Jigsaw, he's, he's a very kind of, I'm coming after you and you're going down and we're gonna peel back the onion and expose you. So Enron, you know, I mean, he, he, Alex um, likes to say, he, you know, his epitaph should be, I'm the guy who made accounting entertaining to America. Because <laughs> um, it is really, you know, but he's a, he's a kind of intellectual filmmaker who makes entertainment. So um, that, I was in the right company at the right time, and, um, and California was in this historic drought, and, it, and will be again. And, and, you know, we had all these rains in um, January, which relieved the surface situation, but the, un the groundwater situation is still like, a, you know, you can't replenish those aquifers that are gone. Um, some are more shallow, like the Kern Water Bank one, so they can be recharged, they can be used for surplus water. Uh, but after decades and decades of pumping, it's anybody's guess, you know, how much water's down there, and, you know, that's something we can discuss if we want to. Uh, so anyway, long story short, um, it was, I was at the right company at the right time in the right marketplace. Uh, National Geographic was reinventing its brand to, be, to kind of get back in touch with its blue chip origins. Uh, they like environmental, they want to be known as an environmental company, and they wanted a blue chip uh, documentary from a filmmaker like Alex Gibney. So Alex EP'd it. Uh, we um, were lucky to get Marina Zenovich, who's um, uh, an award-winning filmmaker um, uh, who had done a documentary on Roman Polanski several years ago. So um, she's <laughs> made the film about the guy who made Chinatown. Um, and here she is making a film about the modern day Chinatown politics. So uh, that was two years ago. Um, it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this year in January and then premiered on National Geographic in March um, at the, uh, as a companion or to kind of introduce a three-part water documentary series that I hope everyone will check out called Parched, Coal in the Water Wars. You can tell I'm an ex-academic. Always put a colon after my titles. Um, <laughs> so, Parch, The Water Wars, those are three one hour documentaries about water issues, two different stories that um, are also great by different documentary filmmakers. Uh, that was a series that followed this. So, they were actually, 
should I tell that part of yes, it? They were all yeah. sold as, uh, it was conceived as a six part series. Um, National Geographic bought it and they only wanted four. Um, Water and Power was going to be episode one and they wanted that to be a feature length, you know, a 90 minute doc um, and the others are one hours. Um, and then eventually they just decided to sort of slice it off from the series and it became its own thing. Um, and um, there was a three part series called Parch, The Water Wars behind that. Um, and then, the, uh, but Parched has been shown on National Geographic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it all uh, aired in March. Yeah, and, and one of the things I liked about uh, uh, just looking at a little bit of that, of that series is that it tried to take the issues that you found in Water and Power and extend them to other places on the planet. Like one of the series is about global water issues. Uh, and yeah. the segment that I looked at was on water issues in uh, another very conflicted area uh, uh, with very contested water issues, and that was Israel-Palestine. Yeah. So was that an idea to be able to take some of the ideas that were in, uh, in Water and Power for the series and then be able to expand it both around the country because there's some other areas of the U.S. that get covered in Parched. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was conceived as a series, mm -hmm. and Water and Power was going to be one episode, California. Um, and the Resnicks. So um, that, um, it really just kind of grew into its own thing. It just grew into it. Uh, but they were all meant to be different stories, distinct stories about water. Mm -hmm. um, and not all about groundwater, but kind of eventually it all becomes groundwater issues, not just drought issues, but issues of contamination. So we told the story, in one episode we tell the story of um, Detroit by bookending it with the story of Flint because the, yeah. the problems of Flint are the problems of Detroit but Detroit's water problems are that it's in hock to Wall Street basically so that's a different issue yeah. they have water but it's not good water not potable water and then there's a global um, uh, episode as well yeah. which uh, goes from the Middle East to um, China and India uh, um, Syria is uh uh, it's, yeah, it starts with Syria. Because yeah, because it's, it's a yeah, Syria, series of water war. Syria is very much a water yeah, war. Yeah, there's a drought at the origin of, yeah. of that yeah. um, civil war. Yeah. So water is, is becoming, a, everything's about water. Everything's about yeah. water. In the global episode, uh, one of the things that um, I was passionate about was, mm -hmm. I, I read another article about um, China getting a fifth water station in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And Antarctica is governed by a treaty that expires in 2048. And um, I think 52 countries are party to it and only some have mm -hmm. the resources to have water stations. So Russia has mm -hmm. several, we have like six, I think, now China has five. Um, and at the, foot, the, the tail end of this article, after talking about all the interests that China and these other nations, including us, have in Antarctica, you know, there's global warming happens and it melts and there's gonna be, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, mineral resources and oil and all kinds of things exposed and water <laughs> because if uh, you know uh, three percent of of earth is fresh water and two percent of that is locked up in the polar um, Antarctica and, and the Arctic so we're using one percent of the earth's water in the surface water these rivers streams lakes etc mm -hmm. so there's quite a bit and people have thought about like t you know this one guy had this crazy idea to tow an iceberg you know chop it off and of the of um, the Arctic and tow it to Europe and sell it or Africa. He actually tried an experiment with it and kind of like melted on the way. Well, the, one just fell off the size of Delaware. Yes. So, you know. Yeah, it's a continually you know, relevant maybe issue. Maybe we could send the Resnicks, uh, put them on that. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. Exactly. Well, they, they, they have Fiji water, which is. Oh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things that a successful documentary does, and I think this one does it, is to reframe the issue. And you see this throughout the film. I mean, uh, water is gold. Water is oil. Uh, it's actually more valuable than oil. You know, we'll have more contestations around oil. Uh, water is um, a uh, marketable commodity. It's not a public utility, public good. Uh, this guy is not a farmer. He is a water broker, you know, uh, and then it uh, also can turn things upside down or inside out, you know, this kind of reframing, like buying all these vineyards and building all these vineyards when the real commodity is the groundwater yeah. that's underneath. So just talk a little bit more about, you know, it just seems that this film just systematically and over and over gives us 
a new frame to understand something that can be invisible to us. It's like the air we breathe. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought about that quite a bit when um, uh, putting the, the, pr the proposal together, um, just how this is you know, literally a hidden, it's a buried story. It's the hidden story that we don't see, um, and, I mean, figuratively and literally. Um, and I think, um, you know, that, that exposing that and like, you know, all the metaphor, anything you ever work on in your life, you know, the language of whatever you're working on becomes your language for everything. So it's like, we're going to dig deep you know, to expose the, the hidden story here and, um, that people don't want to talk about. They want to bury it. They don't want it known. Um, so I thought, you know, it's interesting, the, oil, the water being the oil of the 21st century is actually a quote from a Goldman Sachs executive <laughs> um, because it is so valuable. It is a commodity. Um, and it is traded, and it is, um, I mean, you, right now, you could get a money manager to invest in water for you and, you know, get great returns in the water market. Um, but you, you, what you said about it being the oil, there is no better example of that than, uh, example of that than Saudi Arabia um, not being able to farm everything they needed for the first time. They're just dry. Uh, two years ago. They bought land in Arizona for the virtual water. Did you hear people talking about that virtual water mm -hmm. thing? Um, I know it's a dense, it's hard to kind of take it all in. Um, I don't even fully understand it. <laughs> but um, if you can buy the land and use the water on site, because water's too heavy to move around, you know, icebergs notwithstanding. Um, so that's why it really can't, you can't just get water out of, you know, the Great Lakes and then sell it to Argentina. Um, it's too heavy to move, but you can, you know, if Argentina runs out of water, they can go to Wisconsin and buy farmland and farm and then ship the alfalfa back to Argentina. If that's what Saudi Arabia is basically doing with, you know, water they bought. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to return just a little bit to the Chinatown conceit. <laughs> you know, uh, the film was conceived and uh, has been talked about as Chinatown, the documentary. You know, and uh, uh, talk about uh, selecting the scenes from Chinatown, you know, the fiction about all the nefarious dealings of, you know, uh, the Jack Nicholson character, uh, 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 Gittis, going and investigating uh, what he thinks of as a very personal, uh, he's a private eye, you know, very personal uh, kind of bit of nefariousness. Uh, but in fact, it's about Los Angeles trying to get the water from the Owen Valley. Yeah. You know, and so, so, uh, so the Chinatown conceit came in uh, uh, through Marina because she yeah. had done this documentary. And so how did you go about doing that? I mean, uh, you know, choosing uh, which scenes from Chinatown? Uh, well, those clips were chosen by Marina and Pax, uh, Pax Wasserman, who is a UCSB graduate um, who um, edited the film. He's brilliant. Yes. Um, and he had quite a bit to do with how well made this film is, but um, he and Marina chose the clips. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that um, you know, anytime you want to use a Hollywood film in anything, it, you just pay through the nose. So yeah. uh, there, weren't, there aren't very many. Um, but I, th I think they were, you know, well chosen. They were beautifully chosen. Like when he goes to uh, investigate, uh, and they let loose the the water, yeah. you know, water on him. That's the payoff and then clip. We get, I believe it's Mark Arax discovering the pipe. That is shipping the water. So <laughs> exactly. That was, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, although the only yeah the only thing I wondered about though with uh, the Chinatown conceit, it's so nihilistic. It's so pessimistic. Yeah. You know, and so you're borrowing from it, but still you want to be able to make a film where people don't just go and give up. You know, when they see your expose. Yeah. So there was also a concerted effort to, to. Focus on the activists. Uh, uh, and were there any? Did you think about putting any um, water projects in uh, the film uh, uh, that are ones that are about uh, showing how water should indeed be a public, a common good, rather than a marketable commodity? That's a really good question because I know we talked about that a lot with mm -hmm. National Geographic. They were very, I'm very uh, pessimistic and negative and, and you know if it were up to me I'd be just like you know this is it and this sucks. Uh, and National Geographic was like um, but there's got to be hope. We can't be completely uh -huh. negative and I'm like yes we can. 
because mm -hmm. we're we're really screwed. Um, no, so um, there was, but it was. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Um, <laughs> you know, we tried to create a sense of hope at the end with um, Adam Keats, who's a total hero, um, who's mm -hmm. on it. You know, some 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 lawyer heroes there, um, and Arex, of course, is 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 been doing amazing work mm -hmm. uh, for years. So, um, and you know, luckily f for us, I mean, we pre premiered this film at Sundance in the middle of this you know, epic rainstorm in Los <laughs> Angeles. Uh, and that has, uh, in Southern California, that has, of course, eased our surface drought situation considerably. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people don't, you know, but I, I, that's why I think it's actually good to see, you know, to see all the negative stuff because it's gonna come back. We're gonna wind up there again. It really should be a, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, um, what is the term? I'm missing it. Uh, called arms, mm -hmm. to um, not forget. Yeah, well, I think. Don't take it for granted. I mean, I think for us here, you know, we are uh, very, uh, you know, it, it's going to get us to pay attention to Sigma, you know, and uh, what is going to happen with this attempt to rewrite the Monterey Amendments and to come up with a new contract for water in California. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I mean, I, I will say in the other episodes of Parch, there is more hope, <laughs> and probably in this one. Um, but uh, uh, but there's certainly t t horrible stories we left out too, from kind of like Nestle, um, you know, uh, that whole thing. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, I was shocked to discover when we were first doing the res the research on this, and so I got a couple of amazing researchers, uh, one who had worked on a lot of the Jigsaw films, uh, to be one of my researchers on this. And um, he uncovered all this amazing, like, little-known information about California. So I learned that California was the only state at the time, this was before Sigma, to only state to not regulate groundwater. They didn't even know how many wells, they don't know how many wells are in the state of California because they weren't required to be recorded. And uh, scholars and academics and scientists have tried to get that information, not what they even do have out of the state. It's just all, you know, it's Byzantine. And what Adam Keats had to say about it is, is, is the word I used in my pitch, mm -hmm. and he just used it, you know, and I was like, mm -hmm. felt vindicated. Um, it's a priesthood. It's delib deliberately obfuscatory language. Um, they're trying to um, keep people from figuring it all out. Yeah. It is a shell game. Yeah. That was, an, uh, I thought, another powerful reframing, like the the water brokers, the people who are making the decisions. It's like a priesthood, and it's arcane and secretive and obscurantist? Yes, it is. That's yes. a better word. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and, and, and the, you, mm. it, there are layers and layers, and the language is crazy. The language is really um, bureaucratic, and um, uh, you know things have multiple names, and they all sound the same. The Department of the Water Board, the blah, blah, blah. So it's, um, it takes a lot of, and that was a, a huge part of what we had to do, uh, uh, and the, the production team and the story department, which was really just two people on this film. But mm. I mean, you've got, you know, something that of this scale with this much information, it's so dense, has to be unpacked and repacked for you. And I don't even know if it made sense to people. I hope it did. It was, it was a lot of hard work to just continually try to clarify what, was, what had gone on yeah. back there. Yeah. So um, as I was saying, uh, that our uh, student filmmakers, you know, once they are, they identify their topics and, um, you know, they have to begin to see, uh, you know, how they're going to frame the story, but also who all they're going to interview. And uh, I thought that one thing that was so powerful about this film was the decision to begin and end it in the city without water, in the new Dust Bowl. Porterville. You know, mm -hmm. in East Porterville. Yeah. You know, and at the uh, end, uh, when we saw, uh, uh, you know, people being able to, like, think about taking a shower or washing your hands, you know, uh, uh, that's just, you know, it's like all these things that we take for granted, I thought that helped to bring home to us. We shouldn't take anything for granted. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that because um, there was a lot of um, discussion about how much was going to be set in the present versus the past. I mean, there's quite a bit of this is, is past tense. Um, and it could have been just an interesting sort of historical documentary about the history of water in California, and including the, the Monterey Amendments. Um, but it's really, we felt it was really important to have a present day, present tense story 
where there are um, you know, victims of this or, or, and potential victims so that there's um, a visceral emotional connection to some stakes. Mm -hmm. These people have everything to lose. We all do, mm -hmm. but, um, but we definitely wanted to bookend in that and then sort of intersperse that um, throughout the film. Very important. And then, uh, uh, how did you go about uh, uh, identifying the, the people who were going to be speaking in your film? Uh, I think, as I said, I think it's, it's really good. You've got the experts, you've got the politicians, you've got the scientists, you've got the policymakers. Uh, well, you don't have many on the other side because they didn't want to be interviewed. Uh, but uh, one of the arguments that always gets made about well, what if we are going to uh, take water away from agriculture in California and take it to those greedy city water users? Uh, um, and the argument that always gets made, well, that's going to hurt the small farmers. That's going to hurt the little people. Right. This film blew that argument out of the water, you know, because it was, in, in fact, the small farmers and it was, you know, the workers, you know, who are just completely suffering from all of this. Yeah, yeah, it, it is the small farmers. Um, and that's happening not just in, in California, but anywhere there's a water issue, Texas, um, the, the, um, the Midwest. Um, you see over and over again these bigger, ag, uh, uh, big ag uh, mm -hmm. interests who are able to get the deeper straw and put the little guy next door. They can't bring in, those, those are like oil well drills. Those are huge mega, um, pieces of equipment to go way down um, and pull the water deep out of the earth. So um, it is, yeah, little farmers suffer too. Um, how do we determine who to work with or who to interview? Well, it's, it sort of started with a, with a handful at the very beginning and then, and then you build out as you mm -hmm. just research the story. So I started with um, Jay Familietti, who is the uh, NASA water scientist. Mm -hmm. He's the top NASA water scientist. He's at JPL now. I got him on board as a, I wanted him to be my expert to kind of fact check in a way the initial mm -hmm. um, material we were putting together mm -hmm. uh, and writing up so that um, we could feel solid. I mean, this is a journalistic enterprise as well, and um, you know, if everything's fact checked. Um, we reach out to, to both sides, all sides of the issue. Um, if people don't want to participate, they don't want to mm -hmm. participate, but the, the effort is made. So that's very important too. You, you, you need to cover, and there are actually people on the other side. Um, Tim Quinn. <laughs> um, uh, some of the other people you saw interviewed, uh, you might not know it, they seem a little neutral, but they're really sort of de facto on the side of like letting things be. Mm -hmm. um, and as the story, as we got deeper and deeper into the story and the, and, the, and the story producer and associate producer really dug in, characters kept emerging and Arax, we got him on board very, very early and his reporting is very essential to what we're doing. Adam is somebody we found later I think along the way, mm -hmm. and um, he's, he's really good. Mm -hmm. Just wanna mention one thing about him too, because it's kind of a solutions-based thing. It's, it's not that California never grew almonds, that it, the California has grown almonds. A lot of them were grown up north where there's plenty of water. It's this whole idea of the Central Valley that should not be used for mm -hmm. uh, almonds. They're the most water-intensive crops mm -hmm. uh, out there. I mean, maybe grow other things mm -hmm. in the Central Valley that don't take as much water. Mm -hmm. And Adam's trying to get this kind of ag zone kind of project off the ground where it, you can't tell farmers what to grow or not to grow. Um, you know, perhaps we shouldn't, but you could maybe do allotments and then just maybe sort of fence off uh, parts of the state where you, just, you can grow this, this, or that, but you can't grow that. You have to grow your almonds somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was also reference in the film to uh, the way um, uh, some of the tactics that are being used uh, are, um, uh, uh, tactics, uh, tobacco company Oh, you tactics. said big tobacco. Big mm -hmm. tobacco tactics, like just disinformation mm -hmm. uh, about actual harms, provable harms. Uh, you, were, you were talking about one of the other um, uh, parched episodes, you know, where the same kinds of things were, uh, arguments were used about the uh, uh, material in the water. Uh, in um, the DuPont, the CA. The DuPont, oh, DuPont, yeah. 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 One of our uh, episodes is about the DuPont case, which a couple of years ago, an attorney got a giant settlement out of DuPont after years of uh, going after them um, for um, creating cancer clusters and um, in a plant on the Ohio River, West Virginia, that made Teflon. 
and um, uncovered just uh, incredible documents that were damning about what they knew yeah. about how uh, the workers were being exposed to these harmful chemicals. There was one called C8, which by the way, um, Morgan Spurlock is making a movie about C8. Oh. <laughs> I just read, right? Did somebody else read about that? Um, well, anyway, we got there first. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, it's just shocking. Um, C8 was made by 3M in Minnesota. At one point, they, the, the lawyer pulls out of the, they, they gave him like a million pages of documents and just thought they'd bury him in, in discovery. And he, um, the, the attorney, he took the time to go through them, highlighting, and he kept finding C8, 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 and all these internal memos, and one from 3M saying, we're gonna stop making C8 now because we found it causes cancer. And DuPont's like, great, we'll make it ourselves. So they open up a, 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 a factory or a, a whatever, in um, facility in North Carolina and made C8. Anyway, they, they finally had to stop making C8 <laughs> um, due to this lawsuit, and uh, now they make something else. So um, that's one of the sad yeah. stories of all of this, is like the EPA is, they can only ever like run behind and, you know, after people complain and, and things come to yeah. light and try to, try to regulate, but they can't pre-regulate anything. Yes. Now, I don't know if you're uh, uh, the person most placed to talk about this, but from your perspective, how do you think the film is done? I mean, has it been uh, taken up? Has it been well received? Is it? How has it done? Yeah, how has it done? Um, well, it did well on air. It actually got an audience, um, which was incredible for a documentary. It was shown without commercials. Um, on National Geographic, and usually those films don't rate at all, and it did, you know, pretty well. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of people saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was well received at Sundance. Um, it's been shown in a lot of venues, theatrically, uh, other festivals. Um, I'd say it's been pretty well received for the most part. There had there have been some. We did a panel screening in Sacramento, mm -hmm. um, and we had Tim Quinn was on, um, uh, a couple of the lawyers, uh, Marina. And uh, there was a lively debate about it. Um, it was very much a pro and a con mm -hmm. about whether the water bank was a good thing or a bad thing, whether the, it, uh, Kern County deserved to have it and the, and the residents or not. Uh, there was a real, you know. So uh, I would say people are paying attention and, um, and discussing the issue. Yeah. Um, I hope it gets seen more widely. Okay. I wish they would rerun it. So I think the message of the film and of a lot of the discussion here uh, is that we all need to become policy wonks <laughs> around water. <laughs> to be an activist these days, you have to be a policy wonk. Okay, That's let's for sure. <laughs> thank Lynn Kirby for everything she's done on this film. Thank you.